Jesus loves me is timeless. We've sung it in generations in the past, and hopefully we won't lose it. Um, but I probably told you this before, but every time I sing it now, I like to remember the story that it is uh, a story of the aged seminary professor who was to preach the last time in the seminary chapel. And I uh, found out later, at least some have said that was Karl Barth, whom probably the name doesn't mean anything to you, but among theolog theologians, uh, he would be one of the top ones. So the students were speculating. I'm cleaning house up here, so I got room. Uh, <laughs> clearing, I guess. And uh, so the students were uh, speculating, what's he going to preach on? And... Uh, so he stood up and uh, he said, uh, and this is a guy that would have 10 years at least or more of higher education taught for years all over and uh, in Germany even. He just simply got up there and said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he sat down. Well, when you think about it, what else is there to say? Now, I'm not going to do that this morning, <laughs> in case you got your hopes up. <laughs> but, uh, and I was thinking today, I thought, oh, I wish I'd have thought that it's, it's VBS. I should have preached a VBS sermon. Well, what we're going to talk about is a great story from the Old Testament, and it fits, I think, VBS because they'll be telling stories and they'll be teaching stuff uh, that are pretty uh, amazing and this is an amazing story. So I, I do just want to, I want to take a few moments this morning and talk about my title, Victory or Defeat. Now every one of us here loves to win. Every one of us here wants our team to win. And so um, my question for you this morning is, do you ever think about winning as a Christian? I'm convinced that the majority of Christian people live their lives in defeat. And I just want to challenge you, and this story this morning is going to help us with that. But what really helped me was the devotion, I think it was June the 2nd, in your Charles Stanley devotion book. And I might just add, if you aren't reading these they're short folks but they're powerful and I mean they're short so you can put it in the bathroom and even read it there if you like <laughs> but read it this one just grabbed me grabbed me enough that I wanted us to look at it this morning there and I don't know Maybe you can't see it, I guess, with my bifocals. I can't see it good enough to read it, but I'll highlight some of the things. And by all means, if you haven't read it, or if you have read it, go read it again, because it is just powerful. And in this particular one, he says this, God never intended for his children to live a life characterized by defeat. God never intended for you to follow his son Jesus and live in defeat. And I thought, wow, where have I been? I've thought this myself. I've known people that just live in defeat. And he said, uh, he goes ahead to say, uh, a life characterized by defeat in your thought life, boy, there's the big end, beginning of it, folks. If you can get your thought life under control, you'll go places. Your emotions, there's another one. Your attitudes, your self-control, or your faith. Now, here's what he says. Get this. He paid too high a price to allow you into his family just to watch you fail in your attempts to function as his family member. Let that soak in. We could stop right here and just have a question and answer session about what this means for each one of us, which would be profitable, but I have prepared a few things, so we're going to go on. And so he, he says, God's plan of salvation includes a provision for saving you from yourself. 
Well, let that soak in. Did you ever know you needed to be saved from yourself? Yeah, we do. Because you know what we'll do? We'll mess it up. And God, God's going to save us from ourselves. He did. And um, so, again, he says uh, the key player, though, is the Holy Spirit. I want to talk a little bit about that today. And the Holy Spirit is God's provision for righteous living. He is the abiding presence of Christ's life in you. All my ministerial life, I've tried to help people understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's about as good of statement as you'll ever find there. It's the presence of Christ living in us that helps us deal with life so we don't get defeated. So he kind of finishes up here. Uh, he is the abiding presence of Christ in you, and that is why Paul can say with confidence what Galatians 2.20 says. And that's the lead scripture for the devotion, Galatians 2.20. You ought to have it memorized. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by faith in him, I live, I live by faith who loved and delivered himself up for me. That's what Paul was talking about. Charles Stanley wrote this devotion that is just powerful. And I think we need to, to this morning, try to understand God wants you to win in your spiritual life. And I'm telling you, Satan's going to concentrate on getting you to be defeated. Remember, his name is the accuser. Now, what's that mean? That means he'll do everything he can to get you to do what God doesn't want you to do. And you know what he'll do is stand back and laugh at you and say, look what you did. Look what you did, you big loser. That's the accuser. That's the accuser. And we want him out of here. We want you to be a winner in your spiritual lives. I think it was Jerry Falwell, regardless what you think of late Dr. Jerry, he said we are training champions for Christ. Well, I like that idea. We need some champions in the church because we've all run around with a defeated look on our face and he doesn't want us to be that way. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 fits in here too because he talks about the Holy Spirit and, and I heard this some years ago. Peter, of course, preaches the first gospel sermon, day of Pentecost. All the Jews are gathered, gets up and preached. Jesus was part of God's plan, and uh, you crucified him, and he was raised the third day. That was the big, long sermon, and he quotes from the Old Testament, prophet Joel, and, uh, I mean, there was a crowd. And finally, after Peter preached, he said, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've done real good at preaching repent and be baptized, and you're going to be forgiven, but we left off the big piece. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. What that means is your repentance, because that's turning your life completely around for Jesus, and your baptism is identifying with him, is forgiveness of your past. So we don't care what your past is. Jesus wants to get rid of your past, and this is the way you do it. But people ask me all the time, well, what about what, after you become a Christian, you're still going to make mistakes and sin? What about that? That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to help you with that issue of the fact you and me will still make mistakes and we will still sin but it's not our main intention prior to Christ your intention is I'm going to do it my way and we sure fouled it up didn't we now you're going to do it his way but you need help so I want you to understand how important that is so I think and I if you don't get anything else this morning from what I say here's the statement to take home here's the big idea as a friend of ours Dick Jorgensen used to say what's the big idea of the sermon Victory in the Christian life is attainable. 
And I really believe that Christians and people in the church today don't believe that. And so we live a halfway Christian life, and Satan's got us right where he wants us to be because we will not be victorious, and we will not win people to Christ because we're defeated. But uh, again, that's what I want us to think about this morning. This story here is going to be good to help us with it. Well, we need to remember too, you know, Paul again says in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Wow. Put that on the refrigerator door. And uh, Jesus died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and he wants us to win and we need to change our attitude. Now we're going to take a big U-turn here. It all fits in. I want you to meet Ezekiel the prophet. Ezekiel the prophet is one of the major prophets in our Old Testament. There are minor prophets, 12 of them. Amos and Joel and Habakkuk and all those guys. But there's also the major prophets. Largely, well, these are major players, but these, these books are longer. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then there's Daniel. Now, Ezekiel is one of the least read books of the Bible and shouldn't be. In fact, one guy said, hey, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? And you're walking along, and here comes Ezekiel. And Ezekiel says, hey, good to see you. Uh, what would you think of my book? <laughs> and you haven't read it. Ah, <laughs> oh, good question. I don't know if it's going to happen like that. But I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah. Paul might say, what do you think of my books? Well, I hope you're reading them. They're great. They'll get you through this life. So at any rate, I want you to meet uh, uh, Ezekiel here. It's a fascinating book. And again, you, know, you may not be into Star Wars, but science fiction, okay, can I use that phrase? This Ezekiel is just like that. I mean, what we're going to look at this morning is just a piece. He's got about three big visions in here, and we're going to talk about one that's really fascinating. But it's just that kind of a book. So I just encourage you a little bit. Again, this is uh, the, the people, see, this is the people that they've gone into captivity. They've been captured. They've been unfaithful. And the Assyrians and the Babylonians have conquered them. And they're going to be taken away. And Ezekiel is a prophet during that time. He is captive with them 900 miles, and they're 900 miles away from home. That's 200 miles west of Denver, and Denver's a long ways. Or you can go the other way, go to Buffalo, New York. It's almost from here, 900 miles, long ways. He was 25 years old, so all of you young people, listen to Ezekiel. And he was a POW, a prophet of war. <laughs> And he'd been captive with them for 10 years. This has been a long haul. The captivity was 70 years. It's already been 10. And the people were there because they were unfaithful. And these were desperate times. You see, God had created, God had selected the Jews for no particular reason. God chose a people. He brought them out of Egypt. He gave them the Ten Commandments. They settled the land. He told them how they should live. They said, we'll do it, and they didn't. Now they're in captivity. They're a mess, and we're a mess, so we can identify. Here comes Ezekiel the prophet into a world that is filled with despair. Look at us today. We're hopeless and filled with despair. Families are torn apart. One of my friends talked to a woman who's here from Africa. And he said to her, uh, what would you, what, now that you've been here, well, I think they've, they've, she's been here a year and a half, two years. He said, now that you've been here, uh, he, she, he said, what, uh, what's your observation? Well, she said, in our country, people get married. And stay close to the family. I don't know what stay close meant. It may mean proximity, but I think it meant relational. She said, here, people uh, don't get married as much. And they're 
spending most of their life disenfranchised from their family. Just something to think about, but uh, it is a kind of a topsy-turvy world for us in our world and in our families today. We're, we got a government that's filled with people that uh, won't work together. I'm reading a book on, and uh, part of it's on uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and when he formed the Rough Riders. And if you know a little bit of history, uh, if you don't look up uh, Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, and not the ones that are the school on the other side of the town, although it's named after him. <laughs> but uh, Roosevelt, to form the Rough Riders, he said, I want men from every corner of these United States. I mean, he says, I want guys from New York. I want guys from Montana. I want from everywhere, and we're going to work together. And, of course, the charge up San Juan Hill and the Spanish-American War is all about Teddy Roosevelt. And there's a whole lot more about his life, but he, he really tried to get people to work together. Well, that's lost. Violence is rampant. Drugs and alcohol are everywhere. Churches won't preach the truth. Uh, our educational system won't recognize God. Years ago, I was just starting out, and I heard uh, Dr. Lewis Foster. For years, him and his dad taught at Cincinnati Bible Seminary. Lewis had degrees from Harvard and Yale. Dr. Lewis Foster. He said this. He said, a well-rounded education has three parts. You learn about your world, so that's those science courses. You learn about yourself, psychology. In fact, the word psychology means um, soul. <laughs> and, uh, and then you learn about the third piece to make it a balanced education. You learn about God. Yeah, now you could go to people that are in education, and I think you could pin them down, and they'd probably say, well, yeah, you're right. But times have changed, or who knows what they'd say. But he said that, if you want to be an educated person, you learn about your world, you learn about yourself, and you learn about God. And I found that to be interesting. Well, we've uh, tried to push God out the door. Now he's not completely out, but that's something that is an issue. And, of course, uh, we fight for a woman's right to choose and let babies die. Now you figure that one out. And... Uh, Yet we live in prosperity, folks. It's never been better. The unemployment is the least in 50 years. And Iowa is one of the best places. There's jobs everywhere. There's now hiring everywhere. And yet we're a mess. We are like ancient Israel, folks. So our problem today is what's always been the problem. We've lost hope. Now, you ask yourself, you go to work tomorrow, and you just look at the people you're around. You go to school. Uh, of course, it's summer, so school's out. Wherever you go, uh, do people have hope? We've got hope, folks. It's in Jesus. It's in the local church. And again, as fouled up as a local church can be, it's still God's instrument to do his work in this world. And so, we need to go from hopeless to hope. And Ezekiel chapter 37, if you want to turn to that this morning, is a fascinating story that I want us to just take a look at here in these few moments. Ezekiel chapter 37, you can look on on the board. Uh, mine's NIV and that's NIV. Mine might be a little different version and it may not. And you may have something else. But uh, let's look at it together. The hand of the Lord was upon me, says Ezekiel, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. So he wasn't just standing there. They were going back... We're talking lots of bones, folks. This just isn't a few. You know, you got, you got done with the turkey at Thanksgiving and you had a few bones. Well, we're way beyond that. <laughs> it was full of bones. Verse 2, he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. Well, what's that mean? Been dead a long time, doesn't it? He asked me, this is God now, ask Ezekiel, son, son of man, can these bones live? Hmm, that's pretty 
heady stuff. If you've ever seen an old western and they're out in the desert, <laughs> there's a cow's head, just the, the butt, well, that's what we're talking about, only multiplied many times. And um, these bones could have been from battle also. So uh, Ezekiel's there in this valley, and, uh, you know, um, it's not a pretty sight. Of course, the prophets had uh, dirty work to do in trying to bring God's people back, and these could have been scattered by wild animals, but uh, there's nothing uh, miscellaneous about them. They were as far as the eye could see. That's a lot of bones. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was probably a vision. He was carry, he was, God had provided the vision for him. And like I said, it's, uh, it's kind of fantastic like science fiction. So verses 3 to 10 takes us further. <clears throat> he says, um, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones. Preach at them. That's what he's saying. Say to these dry bones, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, folks, let me just stop for a minute. This is what should happen in every church in the land. <clears throat> hear the word of the Lord. Is there a word from the Lord today? That's what the preacher should be bringing uh, that particular thing. And so I hope that uh, that is taking place in lots of places today. So uh, verse 4, <clears throat> Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then in verse 5, This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will, uh, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin I will put breath in you and you will come to life then you will know that I am the Lord now folks he's walking in a valley he, you, bones as far as he can see representative of the dead Israeli Jewish population of God's people of the time because they haven't been faithful to him so we need to get the picture there so verse 7 so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying there was a noise now you think about this <laughs> he's out in the valley bones as far as you can see and then he hears a noise well I don't know about you but I'd be looking over my back <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and the skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into the, into the slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet a v like a vast army. Wow. Prophesy. And the preaching of God's word does bring a result. Look at what happens to the bones that Ezekiel preached to. And I just want you to know that in your spiritual life, you may be as dead as the bones that we're reading about in Ezekiel, but God can bring life back to you. See, you're, you're spiritually dead, but you're not completely dead. We want you to be spiritually alive. And that's what the Word of God will do for us. And... Uh, Again, we need to be praying for people that may be spiritually dead that they can come to life and we need to do that and let God do his work in us. 
See, where I'm headed with this is that I don't believe we fully understand that spirituality and conversion and all those things are directed by God based upon your faith. So, uh, we need to pray before we act. And uh, one guy said, revival will come, but revival is not totally up to God, and it's not totally up to men. It's when God and men come together, we will have revival. Something for you to think about. So the bones are coming to life. But Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, but as for you, now he's writing to the folks at Ephesus, which was that church that was uh, Jason taught us about earlier, was a pretty good church, but they'd lost their first love. But he's writing a letter there, and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you lived when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now this, we're over in the New Testament now. The bones were dead. They were dry. There were lots of them. And Paul then talks in the New Testament that spiritually, he said, without Christ, you are dead in your transgressions or trespasses and your sins. But we go fast forward to Paul's, probably his last letter, 2 Timothy, and he's talking to Timothy and uh, Look what he says to Timothy there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's pretty powerful. He says, in the, he says to young Timothy now, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, picture yourself in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and that's who's going to do it. And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, young Timothy. Preach the word. Because just like Ezekiel, there's power in God's Word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You want to talk about conviction? You read the Bible and you find out you're not doing something that you should be doing. Or you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. The Word of God will do that. And that's a positive thing. So these dead bones were hearing the Word of God through Ezekiel the prophet and they were coming to life. God was working and God can give new life to all of us. Can you imagine the rattling? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> The sound of the bones coming together. Israel was dead. And the preaching of the dry, dry bones was bringing life, just like preaching the Word of God will bring life today. I don't know how many times I've had people tell me, you know, I read that scripture years ago, but I read it again this time, and it impacted me in such a way that I couldn't dodge it, and it's changed my life. What's the difference? I would guess previously the individual wasn't open to the receiving of the Word of God, but later on, due to circumstances or whatever, then they were open, and that's an important thing for us to remember. And so Paul would say later, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Sunday school teachers, VBS workers, youth sponsors, adult teachers. You teach the Bible. Preachers preach the Bible. People read the Bible and that process, and you come along to someone that really influences your life and that just keeps growing because way back here you heard something that got your attention but now somebody else is getting your attention again and God's working in your life. All of you've got a story to tell. I don't want us to live a defeated life any longer spiritually, folks. 
Satan's done too big a job on all of us. We want to be victorious because Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood so you and I could have a new life spiritually. Now, one last story here that's really great, and that's John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Nicodemus. Now, you, you need to study Nicodemus. He appears three times in the life of Jesus. This is the first one. Comes to Jesus by night. Now, he's a ruler of the Jews. He's a big shot. And he didn't want to talk to Jesus during the day. He might be seen by somebody else, so he came at night. We don't know why he came at night, but that's a good hunch. There's lots of ideas. Text doesn't tell us. And he says, um, <clears throat> good teacher, no one can do these things except he be from God. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, he said, how do you do that at my age? Do you enter a second time into your mother's womb? And Jesus said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. Now, if you got your Bibles, he, he, this breath thing that we just saw in the bones comes up here again, and I, I probably better read it to you lest I uh, lose some of the impact. But John chapter 3, about verse 6, he makes uh, another statement here that uh, kind of chides uh, Nicodemus here a little bit. Jesus answered, verse 5, he says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and of the spirit. Flesh gives uh, birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Now, get this. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born again of the spirit now I've heard lots of definitions and lots of sermons but the born of the water is an allusion to Christian baptism born of the spirit when you're baptized the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at the same time I would say now some will say it comes later on or a second time and I'll visit with you about that because I think there's some validity to some of that but not all of it this thing about breath here the breath of the spirit uh, what I want us to see this morning is simply the fact that our spirituality our being born again our being converted our coming to Christ through the plan of salvation, whatever you want to call it, there is something we need to do, but then there's something God does. And when the two come together, you have conversion. I've told the story for years, and you've probably heard me tell it. And people always say, well, you can't do a thing. Yes, you can. You can accept God's promise of salvation. But you got to act on it. It's like the $100 bill that I always told about. I could lay that $100 bill on the kitchen table at my house and tell you, hey, I got a $100 bill for you. But you got to come get it. And I know Roger Back would be the first one there. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to do that. See if everybody's with us here. And... Uh, well, let's say you never come and got it. You don't make it down there. You didn't get a $100 bill. So I think we argue over, you know, what does God do? What do we do? Are you working for it? No, I'm not working for it. I'm just trying. I'm just trying real hard to receive what God has provided, salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. There are some things you need to to do to accept that or to receive it but in the end this idea of being born again is a supernatural thing I can't explain it but I believe scripture tells us enough about it just like the bones in Ezekiel that came to life who were dead then the breath came into them the breath of the spirit comes into our lives and so the work of the gospel is bringing people to a saving knowledge of God through his son Jesus Christ and we want people to grow and to mature we don't want them to stay like they were and we need to open ourselves up to God and let his spirit work 
So back to Ezekiel here. It's a desperate condition of Israel. We see the power of preaching. He said, preach to the bones. And the preaching of God's word keeps Satan pushed back. Somebody said, what would this country be like if we had not had the preaching of the gospel? Satan might have the whole thing. Preaching of God's word pushes him back. And then let's just look at uh, verses 11 through 14 as we wind this thing down here this morning. I'm sure you're wanting to hear that. Verse 11. Then he said to me, this is Ezekiel 37, verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now, sovereign means he's in control. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. There's the teaching of the resurrection right there. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, but you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you up from them, and I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in uh, your own land, and then you will know that I am the Lord, have spoken, and have done it declares the Lord. See, prior to this, he talks about, I'm going to give you a new heart. And that's a whole other sermon, folks. We need a new heart. So God can work on that heart. We need that. We quote this verse all the time. It's a great verse. I don't think we believe it at, at all. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man or woman is in Christ, he or she is a new creation, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I don't think we believe it. Because we act like a defeated group of people. We are the new creation. That's what we're promised. So this morning, what I've been trying to do is bring hope. I, I want the church to announce the good news of Jesus every time it gets together so we can give people hope. And I wanted us to meet Ezekiel. He's a major prophet. And uh, I, I wanted to challenge you to not be defeated in your life. And I wanted us to, uh, to figure out how to make our lives count more for Christ. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, you think about the people this morning that aren't here. They've gotten up and they're playing golf. They're going to soccer. They're working in the yard. They're doing all kinds of things, and yet the church and Christian people need to try to address that and say, hey, we have good news for you. Remember the devotion? Look at that again. That is so powerful. And then I have one other little statement that uh, uh, I found in another devotion. Lord, this is a prayer. Remove everything within my life that would prevent me from becoming like you. Can you do that? Lord, take away everything in my life that keeps me from becoming like you. I love you and want my life to honor you in every way. And what did Jesus say? I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Folks, there's hope. The hope is in Jesus. And let's not be like the dry bones that Ezekiel preached to this morning. Let's be people of the Spirit that are going to do as much as we can.